Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Vanit Arora. She's the Dean for Medical Education of the Biological Sciences Division at University of Chicago Medicine. And she's gonna talk about why we're seeing so many women physicians leaving medicine. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Arora, it's great to have you back. Uh, in January, Harvard Business Review published an article called Why So Many Physicians Are Quitting. And in that article, it reported that large numbers of women physicians are either cutting back or quitting and taking jobs that offer them more flexibility in terms of hours and the ability to work from home. So let's uh, start. We're going to reflect on this article and what you know from your own colleagues. Um, you know, what do you think about this trend and what are you seeing? Yeah, no, thanks, Todd. It's great to be here from the Pritzker School of Medicine. And um, yeah, I remember seeing that article and it was tragic because it was true. And I think many people think women physicians are insulated from all of the she session that we've heard about with the pandemic and women and job losses, for example. Um, and unfortunately, it's not true. And women physicians, just like women everywhere, are subject to the same challenges that women face, um, particularly around disproportionate caregiving and what happens when um, you know caregiving is upended, like in the pandemic. Um, but also, um, you know, burnout, and a lot of a lot of us are facing burnout in healthcare, um, all the way from the front line to leaders. And so, we are seeing women physicians leaving um, in many different ways, and um, and some of that is you know, early retirement. And some of that is younger women choosing to leave jobs that they feel that are not aligned with their work-life balance. And so this is gives us a lot of pause to think about, particularly in academic medicine. I mean, it would be a concern, you know, for any profession to see women leaving. Why is this particularly a concern uh, to see women leaving medicine? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I would say that, uh, you know, we, there's so much data on the importance of diverse teams uh, performing better. And particularly women add a lot to the table in terms of leadership style, in terms of equity, an equity lens. Um, and being role models. I mean, I'm here at the Pritzker School of Medicine where we've got, you know, uh, in medical school, we do have gender equity in terms of entry into medical, um, into medical education. And so what about when our, our female medical students reach, uh, you know, the wards and, you know, what do they see in the surgery operating room? What do they see when their leaders are giving lectures um, or sending out emails? Do they see people that um, look like them and that model that, that uh, you know, remind them of who they are? And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind that in academic medicine, especially where we still have underrepresentation of women in medicine at the professor level and the chairs and deans level that we have not seen, um, despite equity at the entry level for many years. Um, we have not seen that translate into the leadership level. I also think there's some great data that shows that women physicians actually have better outcomes, <laughs> slightly better outcomes in terms of readmission um, and mortality than um, than their male counterparts. And certainly, while that could be hotly debated, um, they certainly don't have any worse outcomes. And so really do highlighting that, um, that it's important to think about why um, having diverse leadership styles is at the table. And particularly women are, are well known for a team approach, collaboration. Um, and this is across all sectors, including in the political sector, where we do see that there are very big differences in the way that men and women lead teams. I'm curious if this is follows that pattern that we've heard with so much, which is trouble before the pandemic and then exacerbated by it. Is this something that was kind of happening before we ran into the pandemic days or not? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And certainly we talk about how the pandemic has unmasked equity, um, you know, uh, inequity, I should say, everywhere. And certainly this is the same issue here where um, I would say that many careers, including, um, you know, being a leader in, uh, in medicine, have not been compatible with being a woman or a caregiver in medicine. And so we are seeing that the pandemic has exacerbated this issue, particularly for women and others, um, intersectional identities, those that have 
have caregiving responsibilities, that's become really urgent. Um, and so, you know, when when your child care closes or you, you know, you lose your child care because they're sick, you really expose how how challenging it is um, that we don't have um, really good, solid foundations of child care, paid family leave, other FMLA type, um, you know, uh, leave that 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 many people can take, but especially women tend to benefit from. And so those are all issues that that are important, um, particularly not just at the leadership level, but also at the you know, medicine is a very long runway, you know, and um, with these long, long training times, um, they overlap with reproductive timelines. And so you end up having um, family building, you know, that's happening at the time that you're thinking about your first job, you're not well established in your career, and then you're very vulnerable and, um, and you don't have a lot of control over your life. And so those can be those can be very, very um, jarring, especially for women just entering the workforce. Absolutely. And um, the article also suggested that practicing medicine tends to take a greater toll on women, which leads to higher rates of burnout, something you mentioned, lower rates of professional fulfillment, uh, and higher rates of depression. And uh, this disparity can be seen as far back as residency, which is something you point out in that spectrum of training and education. Long process. I mean, do you find this to be true in your own experience? And if so, what do you, what do you think uh, is the case here? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I definitely think that, um, you know, women, uh, there is data to show women do face disproportionate rates of burnout, um, and uh, particularly in medicine. And I think when we think about why, a lot of it does go back to women shouldering disproportionate share of um, family caregiving at home. And so working that third shift, if you will. So there's so many other things that are happening. And then they're also balancing a lot of stuff at home. Um, and so how does that relate to a woman's psyche, especially when she's trying to, you know, deal with the front lines in the pandemic? I think there's also, um, you know, one of the, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out, it's not just a work-life balance thing. I think there's, you know, back to residency, you know, our research has shown that um, in residency, as early as residency, um, you know, uh, women physicians face um, you know, disparities in the way they're evaluated. And so when women are taking leadership roles, even in the residency setting to help improve patient care, they are judged unfairly compared to their male counterparts. And so, um, so that can also lead to burnout. Mistreatment also leads to burnout. And so anytime you have, um, you know, a, a sort of a a marginalized identity, um, you know, you really do um, risk that person being at risk for burnout, not just because of the disproportionate things that are happening to them in the in the home outside of the workplace, but what's happening to them at the workplace. Is the workplace set up for women and other minoritized individuals to thrive? That really needs to be a question that all of us are answering with a yes. And so I'm not sure that we're ready to, to be there, uh, but that's really, really something that's really, really important for us to address. I know, uh, and this is something you mentioned earlier, when you think about women in leadership positions, that we, we tend to see fewer women in leadership positions within medicine. Um, is, is this, uh, you know, one of those drivers of women leaving the prof that profession? And if so, how do we create more opportunities for advancement? Yeah, no, I, I I definitely get this question asked a lot, and I would say that um, you know we there are fewer women in leadership positions, but there are not fewer women, right? And so so that's something that we need to really think about. And there's been a lot of work that's been done by Dr. Julie Silver and others, Dr. Rashma Jagsi, um, to point out that you know women there are women and they're like hidden and they, they they need to be brought to the forefront. And so there are women that are contributing and they are leaders, but maybe they're not being you. Know, know, you know, um, really um, held up to that ideal vision of being a leader. There's also this concern that, you know, medicine, because it is a very long, um, you know, uh, horizon of your career, that if you are facing um, bias or inequity earlier in your career, and you're held back from a pay standpoint or a promotion standpoint, then you're not going to be ready to be a leader, right? You're not going to be the person that when your CV is approached to for a leadership position, they're like, well, you didn't get the promotion before. And so if you've been um, you've been facing inequities before in your career. Of course, they're not gonna, you're not gonna break the glass ceiling all of a sudden, right? Because you because that's why it's there. Um, I think there's also um, 
what we're starting to find out is a little bit more about this glass cliff that a lot of times institutions and organizations when they're um, when they need a shakeup when they know that they need somebody new they put in a woman or they put in a person of color and then that person faces a lot of challenges because the institution needed a shakeup there were things that weren't going well and then for whatever reason maybe they're not coached maybe the organizational culture is actually not set up for that person to succeed they don't succeed and then they fall off the glass cliff and then they're th then they're told well you know we went with the woman last time and look what happened and so we really need to guard against those types of um those types of inherent biases in our in our system and so um so i definitely think that um there needs to be a concerted effort to get women into leadership positions and one idea that um, comes up a lot in addition to coaching and mentorship and sponsorship, all of those things are important. We've written about that are the idea of allies and term limits. You know, is there a moment when, um, you know, because um, when you always compare, um, you know, if you always compare two CVs, right, you're always going to be comparing like a senior man to maybe a more mid-career woman, right? And and the question might come, you know, when do you take a chance, right? And we've got to have people that are courageous take chances and and really put people into leadership positions so that they can thrive. I've seen people in search committees take chances on men, uh, but we're somehow less reluctant, I think, to take chances on on women or on people of color. And I think that's got to change. And, um, and I think one way that could change is that we value diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of leadership. So, so being a good leader is not that you, you know, this is something on the side, it's that you are thinking about these things. You are able to connect with people. Uh, I would say I am a better leader because I have small children and I understand the needs of faculty with small children um, and, um, and our residents and um, our students so that I can sort of highlight and role model that this can be something that you can do. And so, so in, instead of thinking of myself as being, uh, you know, a uh, sort of a, a negative, you know, how can how can that be viewed as an asset, something that I bring to the table? If we start rethinking what we the way we evaluate leadership, we could actually, um, you know, definitely make a lot of forward progress. One of the things that we talked about earlier in this conversation um, is this issue of flexibility, uh, which is so important, not just in medicine, but uh, we're finding it these days affecting nearly every profession. But in your estimation, is it you know, how important it is uh, for healthcare organiz organizations to kind of rethink this concept of flexibility? Um, and why has it been so, so difficult for medicine? <laughs> yeah, well, I would say, you know, the system was built around, uh, you know, uh, I was seeing something on Twitter, the nuclear family, right? <laughs> and, and, and somebody else wrote, well, the nuclear family is, you know, uh, heteronormative white male who's got somebody at home taking care of them, right? And, and I still see that today, you know, I, uh, you know, when I go to, there's a leadership retreat meeting that um, somebody, you know, organization I'm part of, uh, you know, has, and it's sort of half day events, right, uh, for three days with the idea that you would bring your family and your family would, you know, enjoy the, the locale. And, you know, at times I do bring my family and at times that's able to happen. But, you know, on a random month, you know, that's, I'm not pulling my kids out of school or my husband away from work to do that, right? And so, so we do have these sort of um, rituals, if you will, about that are codified in terms of, you know, so thinking about what what a leader is and you know what they need that don't really work sometimes when when you're not in that position of, of being in the majority and so um, so I do think that um, you know flexibility comes in many different ways that's something the pandemic has shown us is we need to be flexible um, and we need to account for the fact that caregiving is happening right as I'm talking to you caregiving is occurring right I've got a team at home and when I was at when I was at home you know when uh, when schools were closed caregiving was happening Happening, right? So even though I'm here with you, caregiving is still happening, right? And so how do we highlight that, you know, um, I don't need to be on my email over the weekend, you know, and, and if I am on my email over the weekend, you don't need to be on your email over the weekend, right? And there are times that I do need to work over the weekend, it's medicine, but, but there are times because of that, that I might not work during the week, right? So we need to really normalize, you know, stable work hours and um, a healthy workforce, because we have not 
right? And, you know, think about residency training, you know, the history of residency training, you know, was, uh, was very long hours, you're forbidden from marriage, you live at the hospital, that's why you're called a resident. And, you know, it was developed by people who were, you know, you know, abusing drugs, right? So, um, you know, stimulants to keep them awake. So, so we have to look deep inside and highlight, was well, that the system that really produces healthy, stable doctors, right? And, and I would argue that this whole crisis that we have in burnout is because it's not the system that produces those healthy, stable doctors. And we need to um, really lead the way to, to produce healthy, stable doctors. And we can, if we are just willing to change. Yeah, I think the, the pandemic is obviously forcing everybody to rethink, yeah. you know, what constitutes flexibility. And as you point out, some of these assumptions about what people can and can't do and about uh, the care machine that sits be beside so many people to, to allow them to work. Um, it's really a delicate balance. It always has been and made worse by this. Um, you know, we talked about in a previous episode with you that you were one of the founders of an organization called Impact, uh, which is essentially a grassroots uh, network that's helped to amplify the voices of frontline healthcare workers, their patients, their families, and their communities. Do, do organizations like this help women physicians feel you know, more connected and help them find additional support? Yes, and I would say that, um, you know, that's so interesting that you bring up impact because it really grew out of Physician Mommy Chicago, which is a, a local Facebook group um, that's led by um, a friend of mine, Dr. Laura Zimmerman, um, and really this, you know, kind of right early in the pandemic, this you know, sort of paralysis of like, how, how can we do something? How can we get our voices heard um, so that people could understand that things were really bad in healthcare, they were really bad in the hospitals and we needed to partner with the public um, to educate them. And so that's really how IMPACT was born, the Illinois Medical Professionals Action Collaborative Team. It was born by physician women, right? Who wanted to make a difference. And we've expanded to include a lot of other people, including, um, you, know, um, uh, healthcare, you know, healthcare workers in all different spaces nurses, pharmacy, um, a variety of other um, spaces, and as well as many students. And I, but I think that identity of being a physician mother is still very important. And I've seen that in other organizations as well. A lot of women-led organizations um, do very well. Um, and I think that's partly because of this idea that um, we work better in a team and we all understand that somebody can't be on first all the time like they're you know you have to share the load right there's um, I there's because by working into team we can do better and some weeks I'm doing well and other weeks I'm not doing so well and we can all share that burden I think of that a lot in sort of team science and advancement in academia as well women uh, physicians and scientists tend to work better in teams uh, be supported in teams but one um, challenge is that team science often hasn't been rewarded at the level of promotion and tenure um, as, as it could be. And similarly, activities like advocacy and community engagement and educating the community and media haven't been also rewarded at that level of promotion and tenure. And so one of the things that impact really taught me is the value of really working in a team of like-minded, mission-driven, mostly women who really, really care um, and um, volunteering their time, but also we can lift each other up. And so I'm really excited to, to report like, you know, I I believe it's been made me a better leader. I know that, you know, um, so for some of these colleagues of mine that are in impact who are now starting new jobs, many in leadership positions, it's made them a better leader as well. And so I definitely think that, um, you know, working with other women is a really important way to lift each other up. Um, and I've seen this also at the University of Chicago with the Women's Committee. Um, our Women's Committee and, you know, departmental and institutional women's committees do great work really trying to work with the system to amplify that, that voice and advocate for women and, um, and really everyone, because childcare is not just a woman's issue, it's everybody's issue. And so whether it's you know, advocating for childcare subsidies or um, helping around bridge funding or promotion and tenure, these are issues that matter to everybody. And you know, as my husband likes to say, you know, if, I, um, you know, if I'm the, uh, you know, if, I'm, if I'm facing pay inequity, it only hurts him too. So, so it's really an, you know, 
know, these are issues that do affect everyone. And so, so I think these are really important. And I, I, I'm looking forward to a time when such efforts like those community engaged efforts, uh, the team science are rewarded as much as sort of the solo discovery that's made in an academic center. I think those are when we know we've sort of equalized the playing field. Well, Dr. Aurora, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to hear your perspective. That's it for today's Moving Medicine video and podcast. We'll be back with another, another episode soon. In the meantime, make sure you don't miss another terrific episode. Click subscribe on our YouTube channel uh, and check out ama-assn.org slash podcasts to get a view of all the great videos and podcasts that we do here. Thanks for joining us and please take care. Thank you.